So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Loring. He's coming to us from the University of Michigan. He got his MD and his PhD from the University of Washington before going to UCSF to get his clinical residency as well as infectious disease fellowship and postdoctoral research. He has since been at the University of Michigan Medical School since 2012 and is one of the leading leaders in the field of RNA virus evolution. So thank you for coming and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thanks. Um, this is really great. It's so great to be invited by students. I know a lot of people probably say that, but it really is. That's great. Uh, projects and like this training program is so cool. Like, I mean, and Emory is such a great place for it. So it's been really fun. Um, and so thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I guess it's also fun for me because. Um, you know, I guess this is an infectious disease across scales, and I'm, I guess, sort of a, um, uh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> kind of person or, or aspire to be. And so I thought it would be good to just kind of give you a little flavor of that. Um, and, and then this is a completely new talk. I'm trying to meet the cross scale uh, theme. And so um, work in my lab, you know, we started out working on uh, viral polymerases and mutation rates and how viruses make mutations um, and looking at uh, the evolution of polymerases. Um, and then uh, we started getting into um, for viral genomics um, and exploring kind of the evolution at a host scale, how viruses evolve within and between hosts, um, which brought us into contact with Katya and her work, which is fun. Um, and then, uh, you know, well, then we kind of went from there to get more into epidemiology and how evolution relates to vaccine effectiveness. And that really got turbocharged um, with the pandemic, uh, which I know many many of your uh, programs have been. Um, and so the topic of today is, um, uh, uh, you know, the theme that kind of unites all of our work is how do mutations or novel vir viral variants arise and spread. And that kind of synthesizes everything at each scale. Um, and I'll kind of highlight some of that work today. And so um, like many of you, I think the pandemic um, you know, brought, uh, you know, our little subfields into all of a sudden, you know, under the spotlight. Um, for me, it was, okay, well, there are all these variants um, that all of a sudden people are talking about. And um, this is an article from the New York Times with noted um, evolution and virology expert, Eric Topol, um, talking about, uh, uh, you know, you know, these variants and being called scariants and mutant porn. Um, and uh, it's it's really a career moment to have what you study be referred to as mutant porn. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and and you know the question is, does any of this mean a hill of beans to anyone? So I will try to convince you that it is a hill of beans. Um, and um, you know, kind of use this as a framework to kind of talk about our work. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story in three parts and. Apologies, it is a talk I've never given before, so we'll see how it goes. Um, feel free to tell me it's terrible, if it's work at the end, then I'll never give it again. Um, so uh, first, I'm going to tell you, um, you know, our work from when I started my lab, um, looking at how mutations happen in cells and what the impact of mutations are, um, impacts of mutations are. Um, and then we'll notch up a scale um, uh, on our work um, in households. Uh, not this household, which I was telling people before, it's actually, that's a real sign. It's a cannabis store on the way to work. Um, and um, and so I just love it. Uh, and then, uh, not personally. I'm a, I'm a parent of teenagers now, so cannabis is not a, a great topic. Um, and then, um, uh, and then um, uh, notch up a, a scale to round up, talk about viral spread in communities and how that affects them. And each part, uh, what I want to convey to you is that evolution is, is somewhat of a constrained process, even though we don't typically think of it as such. Um, 
So Act One uh, is when's the replication itself. Um, and this is a work that I started when I first started my lab in 2012. Um, and as I was, you know, contemplating what to do next, um, you know, reading, rereading the literature, um, you know, trying to get a handle on things, um, I read this review, which is, uh, became very influential uh, for my thinking. Um, and it's this uh, talking about uh, pacing a small cage, and they use a metaphor of a tiger. Um, in a small cage. And so, uh, you know, we, it, it was profound for me because we think of, you know, coming up in the virology field, we think of RNA viruses as, you know, kind of tremendous, you know, tigers of evolution, right? I mean, they really, you know, can evolve quickly. They have endless potential to evolve. Um, and and in the here, they're talking about that actually RNA viruses are heavily constrained and they're in a tight cage and they're pacing because there's only so many pathways um, they can take uh, in their evolution. Um, and this kind of got at the question of, of the ways that they're constrained. And one way that they're constrained is that they make a lot of mutations. The mutations tend to be bad. And few, there are a few mutations that actually help the virus, even though we think that you know, we focus on those because that's where the virus is going. And so that led me to think, well, you know, when you think about viruses that are tigers of evolution, influenza is, you know, or was the big one, right? You know, it's it's you know, if you're interested in virus evolution, for me that where that's where it's at because you know it's got everything. Um, and so uh, we set out to uh, figure out in, in influenza what is what does that cage look like? How many mutations are good for the virus? How many mutations are bad for the virus? What is, what kind of a spectrum of mutational fitness effects, um, which will determine. You know what's available to the virus as it evolves um, and makes all these mutations. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's a pretty inelegant approach, but it worked for us. Um, we essentially took advantage of flu reverse genetics, where you have eight plasmids um, for each of the eight segments, and we made we picked at random uh, 128 point mutations to make, um, and we would just introduce those into one of the plasmids, and so we could, you know just had a, a, a little script to say, make a mutation in HA, make a mutation at this position in HA, make it A to G or B to A, completely at random. And so we made 128 of these, uh, rescued the viruses. So we have 128 individual viruses. It's a library, but it's not really a library because we kept it separate. Um, and uh, each with a single point mutation. And then we made sure that they didn't have any other mutations even at low frequency by sequencing. And then we measured their fitness by competition assay, where we you know, looked at their relative fitness uh, versus a wild type competitor, and then used qPCR um, to measure their fitness um, over time um, as the slope of that regression of the change in frequency. Um, and to summarize, I've always also wanted to summarize a lot of work that a lot of people spend many years doing in one slide. And so that's what this is. Um, and so this is, you know, the flu genome with the, um, you know, age genomic segments, and each one of these is um, uh, an individual mutation um, that we made. And you'll see that there's a lot more in HA and NA, um, which are the surface proteins. And that was by design. We, you know, we, it wasn't completely random. We wanted to have more mutations there because we wanted to do a comparison between, um, uh, you know, uh, protein or genes and then proteins that are under, you know, strong selection. Um, to see the mutation tolerance. Um, and then they're, you know, they're color coded by their fitness effect. And then there's, you know, squares versus triangles for synonymous and synonymous. But I think what I want you to get is, is just a global view of where the fitness values are. And so the fitness is on the X axis with zero being a lethal mutation. And so we define that's by we tried to make virus with those plasmids three times. And if we failed on three different attempts, that it was lethal. So, but any one of the successful attempts if you were not a lethal mutation. Um, and we did some math to show that that was, you know, probably a good cutoff. Um, and so what we did is then, so about 30% of the mutations are lethal. Um, and then uh, the, the about 70% are, um, you know, viable. And this is kind of the cumulative distribution function of the viable mutations. You see it starts at that low um, frequency, but approximately 60 30% are lethal, 60% or so are highly detrimental um, in terms of their fitness values. And then 
you know, there's a, a fraction of 10% or, or um, less that are either neutral or uh, beneficial. And I say that, you know, because we can't really distinguish weekly neutral or weekly beneficial. You know, right around one, it's hard, you know, to really know um, the fitness of that. But I think the big message is most mutations are really bad. Um, and so, uh, you know, it kind of validated that kind of small cage, you know, sort of model um, for what flu is doing in terms of what the effects of its mutations are. And so then we're like, okay, well, it's making a lot of bad mutations. What's its, what's its mutation rate? And so here, you know, I had, you know, my first graduate student, and I was like, okay, I want you to measure influenza's mutation rate, you know, because we want to know this, this other project was going on in parallel. I want to know how many mutations it was making. And kind of looked at me like, this is the dumbest idea ever. Don't we already know influenza's mutation rate? And yes, several people have published influenza's mutation rate. And so what graduate students going to take this project? Um, you know, because really who cares? It's already known. You can just go to the library. Um, and so, but the, the real problem, these are great studies. The real problem is they're largely dependent on, C. you can only measure mutations that you see, right? And those lethal mutations you're never going to see um, because a lot of them are based on sequencing um, or the ability to form a plaque, which only viable viruses will do. So you're biased in what sort of mutations you detect. And you're also only looking at certain mutational classes, right? You might only be scoring G to A mutations or a CDU, and there's different rates of these different mutations. And so I thought we were looking at the tip of the iceberg and we might be biased in our estimates. And so we wanted to get a truer estimate of what whose mutation rate is, or at least what we think. Um, and three reviewers agreed with the true mutation of whose mutation rate, the truer representation of mutation rate. So we took a new take on an old assay, um, the fluctuation test. So this is Gloria and Nilbra, um, you know, classic, you know, phage genetics. Um, uh, and um, for those who know that they, uh, you know, got the Nobel Prize, they, you know, showed uh, that the mutations were random. Um, and uh, this, this fluctuation test, which essentially measures, um, ideally, if you have a neutral marker um, and, the, you know, the frequency, the distribution of how many times mutations are made in parallel cultures is how it works. Um, and there's a lot of math involved. Um, and so uh, what we did is we uh, kind of updated the, the fluctuation test for the 21st century. And what we did is we took advantage of the fact that GMP has three codons uh, and it's four or four that are absolutely essential for fluorescence. Okay. And so what we did is we mutated them in 12 different ways. And each one would then interrogate a certain mutational class and revert into fluorescence. So we made non fluorescent GFP and then looked at how you know, score how often the virus made it uh, fluorescent again. Um, and uh, here's just showing that we made all 12 of those mutations to each go for a specific class. And then we made, of course, flu viruses and incorporated that into their genome. And so the flu virus polymerase replicated that over the course of infection. And so we're actually measuring the polymerase error rate. And the nice thing here is, right, the virus doesn't care if its GFP is fluorescent or not. And so it doesn't, it's essentially a neutral marker. And so even if it's a lethal CDU tends to be a lethal mutation or something, it, it's, it's fine because we're going to capture that. Okay. And so here's what the data looked like. We did this for both uh, Puerto Rico uh, 8, which is a well, you know, in lab strain, that's an H1N1. Technically, it's probably some mongrel strain by this point. Um, and then uh, H3N2 uh, from a recent circulating seasonal virus, Hong Kong 2014. And they these are the different mutational classes. You can see there's a tremendous range of, you know, what what types of mutations flu makes. Um, and, um, but I think the, the, the main uh, focus is that um, the mutation rates are quite high, um, you know, several fold, at least five fold higher than any prior, prior estimate of this mutation rate. Um, and we think that's because we're scoring all types of mutations regardless in all, in all classes. Um, but if you do the math, um, you know, that, uh, you know, it's making about two to three mutations on average per genome. Not every genome is getting two to three, right? There's a distribution. Some genomes may have zero, some may have five. But on average, it's making two to three per replicated genome. And then if you kind of fix that with our mutational fitness effects, right, where I believe 30% of mutations are lethal, 
you get about 60% of newly replicated genomes are dead on arrival if they won't make an infectious virus, right? Um, you know, it's just a bag of gobble of population. And then many of them are gonna have a deleterious mutation, right? So this is highly constrained, right? Like this is not how you would want to design a system that maximize evolution. And so we think that there's actually something else going on that's tuning mutation rate that it's not because of an adaptive benefit that, that you know, there's such a constraint that um, mutations uh, impose on a genome that if you, if you make too many of them, you're really um, not doing yourself. And I think presumably the virus is able to counteract that by just the number of genomes that are made um, so that there's some, a certain population that's still viable. So that's what we learned about cells, that indeed viruses in cells are essentially playing slots, right? Um, they're pulling the lever and most of the time, you know, well, they lose, right? Um, but if you have a lot of people playing the slots machines, um, you know, some of them are gonna win and that's, you know, what moves things forward uh, for the virus. So now I'm gonna move on to, um, it's probably the meat of the talk and kind of talk about where we've done a lot of work which is on um, uh, uh, virus evolution um, within hosts and between hosts. Um, and we started this with influenza, um, you know, uh, looking at, you know, kind of uh, what happens and you know, how much diversity there is within an infected host. Um, it's quite low, um, you know, very few mutations. And then uh, uh, how, uh, how often those mutations make it to the next host. Um, and that was kind of brings us to this concept of the genetic bottleneck uh, or the transmission bottleneck. Um, and uh, households are a great place to do it, right? Because you know, you, we've been fortunate to work with people who have various household cohorts, and then you have two people who are infected at the same time, and they're a presumptive transmission event, and then you can look at the viruses between them and see how much diversity is transmitted from one to the other. Then you can use nice methods like cocktails develop and uh, measure the, the, you know, the transmission bottleneck. Um, that the virus encounters. So transmission bottlenecks essentially capture how much diversity goes from one to the other. So you get the mutations generated in the host, and then you see what's in the recipient, and then you can then infer how much diversity made it. And I think of it as a box of bottle mar marbles that you, you know, draw out and how big is that handful. Um, and so the important thing is, is the, um, if you have a, large bottleneck, a lot of diversity gets transferred over and you're, it's essentially analogous to an infected population. Right? You have a large you know, population being transferred and the allele frequencies can stay the same or increase. Whereas if you have a tight bottleneck, you just kind of may, you may be more subject to random sampling interest. Um, and so um, you, know, you can get a dramatic, dramatic change in allele frequencies. And in general, small populations or tight bottlenecks will reduce the efficiency of selection. Okay, because uh, you know things are likely to do by chance, and uh, if a new mutation arises, um, you can get a deleterious mutation that's transmitted just by chance, and that constrains um, the fitness evolution. Or you can have a beneficial mutation that doesn't make it because it's just being sampled, and so um, it generally it, it's not quite a constraint, but it certainly doesn't favor onward evolution. So the way we do this is essentially, we uh, if you have a population of blue and white viruses, if you have uh, a tight bottleneck, you're just taking one marble out into the new host out of your marbles, and you get blue or white populations in the recipient. If you have a wide bottleneck, you're likely to draw both blue and white, and you'll have blue and white in the recipient. So the way we look at this is now a trademarked uh, TV plot. So I think you have to cite us now if you use it. Um, and I'm glad to see it has been cited. Uh, and so it used is, you know, it's like a TV is, is the origin. Um, and so we plot the frequency of the donor versus the frequency of the recipient of the mutation. Okay. And what you're looking for are things that are polymorphic in both, right? You know, if you see blue and white and donor and recipient, which gives you, and um, so you're looking at things in the middle. Um, and there's not much in, on the TV screen here. And so that suggests a type bottleneck. And this is from blue data. And then um, we used um, uh, you know, uh, the Sova Leonard model that um, Katya and Dan Weissman um, uh, worked on actually with to uh, you know, infer the bottleneck size from this data. Um, and so th this is essentially looking at now, instead of recipient, you're looking at the probability of transmission 
on the y-axis versus the allele frequency in the donor on the x-axis. And you can see there's the trend line in red is, um, you know, as you get more frequent in a donor, you're more likely to get transmitted. And so what we're saying is given, you know, the, the diversity, you know, how big, what's the maximum likelihood, what, how big is that um, uh, uh, handful that was taken? And we can infer that basically the bottleneck is, the mean bottleneck is 1.68, which is quite tight, one to two. Um, and, the, and the blue is a probability of the bottleneck uh, five. So that is quite improbable given the data. Um, and so five is still a fairly tight bottleneck. And so what that means is you might have a ton of diversity in the donor host, but very little um, establishes the infection or serves as the founders um, or the infection. Um, and so that's where we were with flu. And then we had the opportunity um, to apply this to my first virus, uh, which is poliovirus. Um, um, and so we did this in the context of polio vaccines. And so uh, a primer, uh, in case uh, you know some of you might not you know know that there's two flavors of polio vaccine, um, IPV and OPV. IPV is the soft vaccine, um, trivalent and activated vaccine. It protects against disease. It gives you strong antibodies in your blood, um, but it uh, doesn't protect against transmission so well. Um, oral, uh, oral polio vaccine um, uh, is uh, the same vaccine. It's trivalent, a lot of attenuated. Okay, so it's an attenuated strain, um, which was great because it's stable um, in terms of cold chain. It's oral, it's easily delivered in developing, development, uh, developing world. So it's been the workhorse of polio eradication. Um, uh, and it induces stronger mucosal immunity and is more protective against infection. Not absolute protective, but more protective uh, against infection. And so, but there's a problem. OPV, because it replicates, because it's live attenuated, it will evolve, right? It will make mutations. Polio has a very high mutation rate. And so it will evolve, people will shed virus, it can get transmitted, and then it can continue to evolve. And that can be a big problem because every now and then you get a essentially a virulent vaccine-derived poliovirus or VDPV, which can cause an outbreak. And so you've got a vaccine that can rarely cause the very disease that the vaccine is meant to prevent. Not good. Um, uh, so what we set out to ask are kind of what are the early steps in the evolution of the oral polio virus vaccine. Um, and so most surveillance is based on identifying BDPVs in outbreaks um, or nowadays in the sewage in New York and London. Um, and so you can then, but what we don't know is what's happened early on because there's been months or even years of evolution before you get a BDPV. And so we wanted to see what's happening back here. And so this is a project that Andrew Valsano uh, who's a grad student in my lab, it's sad to see him graduate, um, is, uh, did uh, in collaboration um, with Mami Taniuchi uh, at UVA and Mike Vandalari at the Institute of Disease Modeling. And, um, and this is Andrew in Bangladesh um, with um, you know, one of our colleagues, Kajal, who helped us with the project. Um, and so what Mami and Mike had done was this uh, study of the oral polio vaccine in Matla, Bangladesh. Uh, and essentially, you know, it's a cluster randomized trial. I don't want to get too into details of the arms. It was to look at shedding and transmission of the OPV vaccine. And so basically, you had a bunch of infants, 788, um, who received monovalent OPV2. Okay? Um, and then they, they had weekly school samples. And then their households, uh, members of you know, their families or whoever they live with, um, also provided sleep samples, so you can see a transmission happen um, to their household contacts. And so, um, and this was all done, and they had done the study, and they knew which were positive. And so, we did the easy part and went to the freezer and we sequenced a bunch of food. Um, and so, we had a total um, 219 mlpv 2s and 52 household contacts, um, and then the 416A were the number of samples. So more, more samples per person than they were taking weekly. Um, and then what we did is we take the total click acid um, and we did uh, RT-PCR and four amplicons um, to get the whole genome. And then we sequenced them on the MySeq. And we also had QPCR to measure time. Um, 
And so the first thing we learned, which was expected, is that sequencing from feces is harder than sequencing from nasal swabs. Um, getting an intact RNA genome out of feces is not as straightforward. Um, you know, and we were quite happy with what we got, um, even though it was less than what we typically get for flu. And so this is the copy number of OPB uh, per gram of stool. Uh, measured by QPCR versus the weeks post-vaccination, right? There's a vaccination campaign. So they all got it for a trial. And then, you know, they all got a common lot. And then it's evolving, you know, in different uh, individuals. And so um, we kind of color code this by, uh, you know, the grays are no data. Uh, you know, as we get further out, our load goes down. We don't get good sequence. Um, we, and then the, the, the light blues are partial sequences. The dark blues are a full genome consensus, and then the red ones are where we get full genome consensus and then minority variants that we're confident in. Um, and uh, so this was our raw data. Um, and then we've started looking into them and seeing, okay, what are we seeing in common that's happening in these recipients that would be signs of adaptive evolution? And so uh, what we uh, found were there are these three what are called gatekeeper mutations. We didn't come up with the name or discover them. Um, a lot of that goes back to Adi Stern um, and Roland Dino, who did this very nice paper. But essentially, these are three sites in Sabin, the vaccine strain, that revert to the wild type uh, corresponding red to so the reversion of attenuating mutations. And there are three of them two in the untranslated region, which controls replication, um, A481G and U398C. These are part of RNA structural elements that are known to be important for virulence. And then BP1 I143X, because it, we saw it mutating to a bunch of different amino acids, it's a key position in capsid, as I'll show you. Um, and so what we saw is these came up very quickly. Um, uh, you know, within a week or two, A41G, which is a major virulence determinant, is already reverted. Um, and then, uh, you know, these other ones take a little bit longer. And so this is showing the change, the, the box plot is showing the change in frequency per week. Um, so we were able to kind of quantify that. And um, this was different for us, right? Because flu, we weren't seeing much diversity. We weren't seeing much adaptation um, within hosts. But flu is already fairly well adapted, um, whereas, you know, OBB, it's attenuated. And so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, it's able to hit upon, you know, there's some big impact mutations that it can make, these mainly these reversions. So if it hits on them, this will sweep um, quite quickly, where it's not, that's not quite off, as often the case with it. So. Okay, and then we saw a very strong positive selection in the cast and elsewhere in the genome. And that's something we were never able to do with flu, or really, I don't, we haven't been able to see much with, with um, SARS-CoV-2 either, for that matter. That, um, but here, we were able to actually do DNDS, which is fairly insensitive in this scale, and we were able to see um, you know, strong, uh, you know, uh, DNDS um, in the capsid. Um, and then we also looked at um, signs of selection by looking at mutations that independently arose across multiple individuals. So it's essentially, you know, parallel um, evolution. And, uh, and so what we did is we saw, looked for mutations that were independently identified in four, um, at least four individuals. Um, Jesse Bloom and Catherine Chu had developed this kind of nice, and Louise Mantua had developed this kind of permutation test to see, given the number of mutations, given the size of your genome, how often are you going to have the same mutation by chance? And for polio, it's going to be greater than four um, individuals. And so that's a sign of that's more than you would expect. Um, and you can see that we found a lot in the capsid. Some of those subset of those were in the antigenic regions of the capsid. Um, we found the three gatekeeper mutations as well as mutations elsewhere in the genome. Uh, so we're not only identifying reversion of attenuating sites, we're identifying mutations that are happening elsewhere uh, that are conferring some sort of benefit that we're newly really identifying. And then this is just showing um, where they are on the polio structure. So this is uh, looking at the capsid um, structure, and it's a non ovulant virus, the five-fold axis of symmetry. Um, I think you can see. Um, and then uh, this is kind of the cross section. The other view is kind of the cross section across. And we color coded them based on the number of individuals that had a given mutation. And you can see, um, well, the, the yellow one is BP1143. Uh, um, 
And then there's uh, these other sites that are also quite frequent and they tend to cluster together and these happen to be the antigenic sites um, in, in polio. And uh, we don't think of it necessarily always selection on an immune escape. Um, you know, remember the population is getting this. So we're not sure that's what's going on, but the same residues are probably involved in kind of receptor binding and replication um, and capsid stability. So there's probably multiple selective measures. But I told you I was going to talk about transmission. And so because this is a household study, we wanted to look at transmission. And here, unlike flu, we've got diversity, right? And so we've got diversity in the donor. So we can say, okay, how much of that diversity gets passed on, which in OBV is huge, right? Because like I told you, you got reversion mutations happening within weeks, and but it takes months or years to get a BDPD. So what's happening? So we wanted to look at the transmission bottleneck um, in polio. And so what we did is, again, took the same approach. Um, you know, we had the household contacts. We had some of those that were positive um, and still looked at the diversity in the kid, uh, the infant, and then the household contacts and see how much was shared um, and got transmitted. Um, you know, it's a little bit different from flu because there's probably a lot of immune stuff going on, right? Because, you know, the adults are all immune um, to polio. Right? And so they, there's transmission happening, but there's not as much happening in the recipient host as there is with influenza. Um, and so this is, again, just showing the data is much more sparse. So we have to, that's a big caveat limitation here, right? We only have like a handful of household pairs where in flu we had like 40 or 50. Um, so there's a, the data is not as robust, or well, robust, but it's sparse. Um, but basically, uh, we found, again, a type bottleneck. Um, for this fecal oral transmission of a, of a live attenuated vaccine. Again, of one to two, here are the bottom line is a bottleneck of three. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what the data would look like in terms of that red line versus the blue line. Okay? And the shaded, I didn't mention, of the 95% confidence interval um, uh, of the model. And so, again, a tight bottleneck. But then we were like, okay, well, wouldn't it be cool if if we know the bottleneck and we know the frequency over time, can we predict how often the mutation will get transmitted and what the impact of the bottleneck is? And so that's what we did. Like we know at week one, after vaccination, you know, the 498, the 481 mutation is going to be at this frequency. We know the likelihood that that's going to get transmitted given the bottleneck now. So, you know, what, what does that do? And so this is essentially that model where we say, okay, you know, each week, what's the probability that that these mutations will get transmitted? Um, and for some of them, they're quite high. So 481, you know, in week one or two, it's already at a frequency that it's likely to get transmitted. Okay. Um, presumably, it doesn't go very far. Like, it doesn't establish a long chain because the recipients are more immune, right? Um, and so, you know, it may just get in. It might just be one link in a transmission chain. But it, it's more likely to transmit. However, these other ones, you know, they're probably they're less, much less frequently transmitted uh, because the, they don't rise to a frequency where they can transmit the type of bottleneck for bias. Um, and so there, that is where the bottleneck is really constraining the evolution of things. Is that you know it's kind of a race. Like you know, most transmission probably happens within the first week or two. Um, you know that the viral loads are high enough, et cetera, that there's enough. In the, in the feces uh, that they get fecal oral transmission. Um, but, you know, the, for these mutations to make it, they have to arise pretty quickly. Um, and it's, it's not as likely that they do that, thankfully. Um, and then what we did is we said, okay, well, we know the probabilities. Let's look at our population as a whole in the household contacts and see what the frequency of these mutations are. And that's what's shown in the last plot is you take all the household contacts, you look at their sequences, how often did you see these mutations, right? Because they could only get up from transmission. And it's, it actually matches kind of the model prediction reasonably um, in terms of, you know, what you would expect given how frequently they rise and how frequently they trans. So if we think this really suggests, you know, the role of the bottleneck and kind of constraining the spread of these mutations. So then, um, we had a pandemic, and, and um, uh, we were like, hey, we know how to look at this stuff. Let's look at this stuff um, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, 
And uh, we were certainly not the first ones to look at bottlenecks in SARS CoV 2. You recognize this figure. Um, this is a study um, from Mike Martin and Katya uh, looking at the bottleneck um, in SARS CoV 2. Um, and so here it is. It's, it's always one or less frequently two um, in terms of uh, the bottleneck that SARS CoV 2 experiences with transmission. And um, uh, we were wondering okay, well, what interesting questions are there going to be? Oh, yeah, there are these variants of concern, right? People are talking about that. Eric Popel is tweeting about it. Um, and so we're like, okay, well, th we know these variants of concern are more transmissible, right? Or at least, you know, debatably so, right? Alpha is more transmissible than, than the non variant. Um, and then we had Delta, super transmissible variant. And then we had Omicron. Um, you know, which is transmissible, or how much of that is due to mutation, et cetera, you know, open for debate, but it does spread more quickly. And so what we want to know is, well, we've been running this household study throughout the pandemic. We can answer this question, right? Like, if you have a more transmissible variant, does that give us more of a force of infection? And if there is, how does that affect the bottleneck, right? Is, you know, with the, will you have a looser bottleneck if you have a higher force of infection? And so we set out to answer that question. And so we have two household cohorts that we were able to do this. We we're actually able to have like 60 something transmission transmission pairs. And uh, thankfully our household cohorts are set up now that we do serial sampling of individuals. And so we get multiple samples over the course of infection. And so what we did is we like, we took the first positive sample from households that had a CT value less than 30. Okay, and so that means it could, it could be maybe somewhere on the way up uh, to peak or just after the peak coming down. And what we did here is we plotted the CT values with an inverse y-axis, right? Because higher viral load, uh, higher, higher nucleic acid is with a lower CT value. And you can see that in the, the filled dots are our sample, the ones we sequence. Okay, and you can see we're getting people somewhere near the you know peak. Maybe, maybe just after the peak, we don't know because we don't know what happened before their first positive. But um, you know, probably when their viral loads are the highest is what we're sequencing, which you know is both good for it's probably reasonably near transmission and allows us to get the best sequence data um, in terms of measuring diversity. And then this is just a histogram showing a number of um, single nucleotide variants per specimen, not specimens. Now there's a typo in the paper. Um, and so I noticed that last night. I was like, ah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, that we have a fair number of people with multiple specimens. And then here's the distribution of individuals per household. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, we got a lot of old people uh, in two person households. There were some in children that, you know, the people who answered the phone to enroll in the study were old people who were kind of alone. And, you know, uh, that was just the way it worked. So maybe not representative of your cloud. But we did have some uh, ones with four children in the household. Um, and then these are the different non VOC, everything before alpha. Um, and then alpha, we have just one or two households with gamma, um, delta, and Omicron. Um, I don't think we had any beta households. It wasn't much of a thing initiative. Um, and then here's the TV plot with the frequency of the donor and frequency of recipient. You'll notice it looks a lot like flu, right? Not much in the middle, so we have a tight bottleneck here. Um, and then the red dots are um, one household, okay? Uh, which I think was a, uh, um, I think it was a gamma household. Um, one dot, you know, either gamma or non VOC. I can't remember now on the spot, but essentially one household with four individuals that share one single SNP. So, you know, you can, Play around with it. It's it all you know the frequencies you can match them up. People, one household where there was shared SNPs among them. Everything else, nothing shared. And so, what that gave when we crunched the numbers is that non VOC was gave us a bottleneck of two, which is just due to that one household and one SNP. Um, and that's why the confidence interval is you know two to two. <laughs> it's like you know, and then. Uh, for alpha, delta, and omicron, it was one. So I don't really think that these they're statistically significantly different. I don't think that it's really there's really any difference. Um, but basically, the message is these more transmissible variants have a still a tight bottleneck. And so these these ideas um, is that they're you know 
probably because we're measuring a type bottleneck, but because there's no diversity, um, there's no diversity to use to estimate a larger bottleneck, right? And so we, we're kind of agnostic about whether more viruses, you know, actually transmit um, uh, at this more founders. Um, but the, by the time you sample, there's just not enough diversity in one you know, to really infer anything other uh, than a tight bottleneck uh, in this situation. And, you know, we make the argument, which is a little bit of hand wave, is that you know, the virus transmits very quickly. We're capturing within two or three days of infection, and there's just not enough time for diversity to be there. And with a more transmissible virus, you know, that's going to replicate quicker and transmit quicker, there's even less time. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is probably what's driving the type bottleneck. And again, that's a constraint. If you can't, as we saw polio, if you can't trans, if you can't uh, develop your diversity quick enough, uh, and polio, the oral polio vaccine is sort of an extreme to this, you're not going to be able to, the transmission is a big constraint um, in terms of the evolution of the OC. All right. So I'm going to round up by talking about um, community spread, which was methodologically a very new area for us that kind of um, happened during the pandemic. Uh, so this is a Google map of Ann Arbor. Um, this is where I live, near the House of Evolution. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, so early on in the pandemic, um, we got um, a contract along with colleagues from Wisconsin to look at uh, the spread of SARS-CoV-2 on college university campuses. Um, and this, we started in September 2020. So remember, September 2020, first wave happened, people going back, but schools largely remote, the students on campus, they didn't have alpha yet. It was just, you know, old school SARS CoV 2. Um, and so this is from the New York Times, a new front in America's pandemic college towns. And there was a lot of discussion about how college kids were partying and violating pandemic things, and then grandma got COVID and died. Right, like that was kind of the news story um, because you would see case rates go up, and then you would see case rates in the community go up, and so bad college kids, you know. Uh, and so we were like, well, let's look at this, um, and uh, so we did. And so what we we were sequencing throughout the fall term of 2020, University of Michigan was like many campuses. There were students there, but they were essentially had measurable lives like everyone else and they did class via Zoom. And, uh, you know, there were quarantine housing and testing and all that sort of stuff, um, the battle phase. Um, and we were sequencing everything from our university clinical micro lab, which is a large academic health center. That's a lot of testing in the community. Um, and this was before antigen tests, right? So before getting their couple of tests, um, you know, via that way. Um, and then we also tapped into University Health Services, um, their testing. And so we got a lot of sequences. I think we sequenced 1,600 viruses that term um, and uh, 1,659 genomes. And uh, this is kind of the epi curve of a lab confirmed cases. Okay. And the yellow ones are students. Um, and so they came back uh, at the end of August, and then the term ended at Thanksgiving. Um, and then the other ones are case counts in our kind of catchment area of Washington our County. Um, and so this is showing kind of the fraction of the genomes that we sequence to give us an idea of how our sampling is. Um, we can do this by the students uh, or by looking at Washington County or Region 2S, which includes um, surrounding counties and a little bit of Detroit, uh, because obviously our academic medical center draws from more than just Washington County, which is a small place. So depending on how you determine the underlying population, these are our sampling, which we were actually pretty happy with, you know, in terms of, you know, 10 to 20% of our, you know, defined community. Um, it's pretty good sampling. I mean, better than what COG UK was doing in England at the time. Um, admittedly, that's a much far, larger catchment population, so I'm not ragging on that, um, but we're counting what we were able to do. And we had 400, 458 students. I think did this by cross-referencing after a bunch of legal work with the registrar's office. Um, much, much legal work. Um, and so um, this is our tree, okay? And so largely uninterpretable, um, but, um, uh, the students are red. Um, our 
Michigan sequences that we did are in light blue, and then other North American uh, genomes uh, for context are in dark blue. And then uh, West, I, what I want you to see is there are a lot in, you know, of introductions around August. Students come back, they come back for a global university, and one brings their viruses back from where they are. And we had 100 something introductions in August of uh, 2020. You know. um, and so then what you can also see from this tree is that there's two um, cluster A, cluster B down here. There's two that kind of you know had a lot of descendants and spread. Um, and so what we did is we had, what is it, uh, 11, what's A to a K, 11 uh, or 10 uh, clusters that we identified that uh, had multiple sequences, okay, um, you know, lineages. Uh, two of them were A and B, and then this is kind of their, how long they were on the x-axis spreading in our population. And you see A and B, a big introduction, they had sustained transmission for some time throughout the long term. And they, um, uh, the color coding of those dots are residence halls um, and it includes off campus um, and fraternity and sorority life. And so we color code them. And I think what I want you to get is that those viruses spread widely um, throughout the campus community, which is perhaps not surprising, right? Um, no one just stayed in the residence hall and didn't go anywhere. Um, that would be cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and so they spread widely among the students. Well, then we said, okay, well, of those student viruses, those introductions, you know, uh, that has been said, did they then spill over in the community? Can we see them as descendants on the tree in our community samples? And so here's just looking at cluster A and B. They got their own pangal lineages, right? I mean, they were like they were not seen elsewhere in the world, basically. They're, they're, we, we call them, I got in trouble because I called them the Michigan variant. And then the state of the was like, please don't call them that. Um, so, uh, this was uh, these two lineages, and they're shown in maize and blue, our school colors. And you can see that they, and these are overall uh, 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 counts uh, of cases. Uh, and you see that they kind of, disappear. Uh, they didn't go anywhere. And then we looked at this another way. And then we said, okay, on the tree, how many of these are descended in the community um, from students? And so these are total genomes on the x-axis and uh, uh, the y-axis. And then the red ones are descendants from student viruses. I mean, we have way more sampling of the community than we did of students. And like 1,200 non-student viruses in that community. And what you see is that basically there are very few uh, I think it's like 5% or fewer of, of our community sequences were actually descended from viruses we saw on students. Okay. And so the message here is what happens on campus is stay on campus. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that kind of goes against this idea that, um, you know, the students, you know, lead to spread and that infects, you know, uh, people like me uh, or older um, because. It's not really shocking when you think about it, right? Like, how often am I hanging out with college kids? Not so often, uh, especially not during the pandemic. And so, like, you know, what it highlights is that there's these, you know, these social networks, right? Like, who's hanging out with who? What's happening? And that is also a barrier to spread. These could have been the big variants of concern, right? They were spreading quite widely, but they never found enough, you know, community hosts to really make it in the big time. Um, we got a little more clues to this in winter 2021 um, when there was the B117, now known as Alpha, right? And so this is from Washington County Health. This is January 16, 2021. Um, and it was identified in Washington County. And, uh, and this was great uh, town gown relationships mm -hmm. because it happened in the university athletic program. Okay, it was, it, was, uh, it was on a sports team. And it was on a sports team because they were getting tested three times a week because we're Big Ten, and athletics is important. And so our athletes, you know, they need to know if they have COVID. And what we found is actually there were two sports teams that had independent B117 um, introduced. Uh, two women's sports teams probably trained together, but they had two different variants of B117. But this led to a massive response of testing of the campus. And there's mandated testing of the entire student population on a weekly basis, case finding, 
uh, contacts of contacts were traced and, and sampled and sequenced. We did, I don't know, a couple thousand genomes in January and February. And here's a tree, here's what we found out. And, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, so there was a lot of virus on campus, okay? Very little of it was B117 or alpha or anywhere. Um, and you can see 20G um, and 20A were huge. And I'll tell you 20G, fraternity and sorority life. That's where it was, okay? Um, uh, uh, and the B117, which was used to be called five, this is the next claim is 501YV1 uh, at the time. Those are red. And uh, what we found is that there were um, just three introductions, three clusters, two in athletics, one in a graduate or professional school, which I'm still not allowed to say what it is. Um, and, uh, um, but, you know, what I think this highlights is, is that it's just where it was introduced and they were able to contain it by heroic contact tracing and the fact that two of the three introductions happened in athletics where they really cared about extinguishing this thing. Um, and um, if B117 per chance wound up in fraternity and sorority life, the outcome would have been different, right? Because we see this highly transmissible variant that lands in the right social context where there's going to be a lot more spread. And then this is um, another tree view um, where to show the three clusters A, B, and C, and uh, the number of cases in each, 13, 9, and 16. So you can see one, two, and then the third one is, oh, it's the light blue. Um, here. And so um, you, the cluster A and B were the sports teams, and they were extinguished pretty quickly, as well as cluster C. And, and But then these are all B117 down here uh, that we sequenced, but you'll see that each of these clusters got extinguished, and they don't really have descendants. So those didn't seek the community um, because they were, they were controlled. Um, and what happened is there were later B117s that were introduced to campus from the community. Um, and those those were what became B117 over. So another case where a campus to community wasn't really happening. It was, it was, you know, um, kind of these two populations that were living um, together but not um, interacting with their viruses. Then the last minute I'll just tell you about we had a fall outbreak of influenza in 2021, you know, and this is kind of more of a normal. Uh, semester, like this is after the you know, vaccines and boosters, they were mandated for all students. Restrictions were, um, you know, largely not there. Campus life was back to being normal. And then we had a flu outbreak on campus where we had uh, 866 cases in a week period. Like, University Health Service was like inundated with all these students. Um, uh, and there were 4,000 visits um, in a couple week period. For influenza like illness. Overall, um, we were able to sequence 535 um, uh, with the phase assigned, and we got whole genomes on 361 of these. So we sampled this outbreak pretty well. Um, uh, and we were able to show um, that it was a clonal outbreak. There was a single introduction. We were able to identify the early cases, and we were located in an amplifying event uh, during a fall break, a recreational trip um, that the students took. Um, and then, but what I want you to get from this tree is, is just, um, these are all flu viruses that we sequenced in my lab from fall 2021 into 2022. Um, and so we just used like a next screen build to kind of visualize this. And so it's something like a couple thousand um, genomes. And the outbreak ones are all in yellow or maize. Um, and uh, the uh, non-outbreak ones are uh, in blue. And I think you can see that, um, and this is just an HA tree, but the whole genome looks similar. Um, but essentially, the outbreak ones stayed on the students. There's no descendants um, of those. Like it stayed with the students, and then the outbreak was over. Students went on Thanksgiving, and that was it. And then there were later introductions of influenza in the community, and that's what carried on. So, a third example with the second virus of this phenomenon and, and others have seen similar things. And so I think it just highlights how, you know, again, this is another constraint. You could be the best virus in the world, but if you're not in a situation where you're finding other hosts at that scale, you're not going to make it. 
Um, uh, and so that is, uh, we see it as another constraint to evolution. So I hope I've convinced you that when we look at cells, we see a mutational constraint. When we look at um, uh, households, we see the transmission bottleneck imposes a constraint on transmission. And then when we look at a community, we find that, you know, kind of these social networks or, or what have you, um, non Facebook based social networks uh, or interaction networks um, uh, actually have a big effect on, you know, how new variants are able to become the next big thing. And so all those are constraints and, and will tend to limit, um, you know, the evolution of a new scary variant of concern, uh, for example. Um, and so this is just a you know, covariance view of, of kind of the ways of, of variance of SARS-CoV-2. And I think we've been used to like, uh, you know, the virus just keeps doing these things and it's unstoppable. And, and I think it, it is. <laughs> I, what I, the message here is uh, not that everything is rosy. It's just think how bad it would be if it weren't <laughs> these constraints, you know, how fast the virus would really evolve. Um, and so that's the silver lining um, that I see here. And so I'll conclude by thanking, uh, there's obviously a lot of people involved in this work. This is my current lab uh, folks with the people whose work I talk about in bold. Emily Bendel's uh, currently doing um, a lot of our uh, within host stuff. JT McCrone has started our flu work um, uh, as a graduate student. Um, and then uh, Andrew Valisano, who did a lot of our SARS CoV 2 and did the Polyvars project. And then our collaborators at School Public Health, who helped us a lot with our cohorts. Um, funders, and then the um, Not Lab project um, with polio uh, that I mentioned, and then the SARS-CoV-2, as I'm sure you have here, like there's been a lot of collaboration with our public health partners, the county and state health department, and funding from the CDC. So I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. I'll just repeat this one question since it, how many household pairs were there for the polio study? There were in the end, there were many household pairs. The only we had four where we had um good whole genome minority variant sequences where we were confident. There are some with partial genomes that we were able to use, um, but four that were like bomber off of evidence, and so that's pretty sparse. Um uh admittedly. Um, I have a couple of questions about the polio work. Yeah. Uh, also, um, uh, first, I just assumed that, that the vaccine, um, there's like none of those gatekeeper agents were like in that vaccine stock. Yeah. Like, right? Like, yeah. I still need to know about these agents. Well, I, I'll tell you. So, so the question is uh, so we're the guy, yeah, we're the, we're the gatekeeper mutations on the vaccine product. We asked, we tried to get the vaccine lost. So, vaccines, the oral flow vaccine is always sequenced, um, it's part of their process um and so that but they only can tell you they only say there's a specified cutoff of like 90 percent or something um so there could be things at low frequency in the lot um particularly like that's where you want um we tried to get a lot that was used uh to sequence it but we couldn't um and then but you know so that's a possibility um you know certainly given that quick um and then the other I want to mention is which she brought up is so there's a novel oral polio vaccine out. So uh, uh, Roland, you know, and others in collaboration with Gates uh, Foundation that developed uh, ways of tinkering with the genome such that like the 481 mutation doesn't happen, um, and also reducing the chance of the mutation or recombination. On um, this one called novel oral polio vaccine, and it's now been given to a couple hundred million. People and uh, the CDC and WHA have published that there's not, they haven't been able to detect these key gatekeepers, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of actually, um, so you're seeing within the recipients of the oral polio vaccine kind of these gatekeepers that you just kind of arise and yeah. parallel and yeah. so on. So, so um, for those onward transmission events, um, is there any indication that that bottleneck might also be a selective bottleneck? Yeah, we. No, no indication, but uh, absence of evidence and evidence of absence. No, uh, yeah, because we, we don't have that. We, we just don't have the numbers to really do it. Yeah. So, yeah, super interesting, right? I mean, clearly, some of them make it and are selected because they wind up there, they wind up down the road. But, yeah. 
can't we can't distinguish but to your blue uh, household yeah um most most of the households were uh blue numbers right so uh, yeah two three four so SARS cov 2 is low um the flu one uh which i didn't talk much about the data mm -hmm. so that was a different cohort and that was all there had to be children so they tend to be three or more and so they're like three to five but um, household yeah. numbers so um the, so the one I showed you was SARS-CoV-2, um, and that was a different cohort, and so a different kind of underlying population. So did you have the chance to see if one donor was able to transmit to blue people? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, you have a question about, you know, when you have trios or quartets, yeah. how do you do this? And with trepidation, um, because it's hard to know, even in a two-person household, were they linked? Or were they infected by a common person? Which of course is a big issue, right? Because if they were infected by a common person, they're not gonna share much diversity anyway, as if they were a transmission pair. And so that's an important thing to think about. I don't know of a good solution. Um, uh, but then there are, uh, with TRIO, we'll look at every possible transmission pair, unless there's clear epi evidence that one with one and another. I think there's probably like a handful where we'll have clear evidence of one, then one, then one, um, and you know, based on the timing. Yeah. And in the sampling, it's always, yeah, always get consensus, right? So you, but, but it's transmitted, probably from the sampling. I mean, or most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. I mean, every now and then there's one with, you know, two different variants. Yeah. yeah. based on this outbreak alone, 
to get enough numbers to actually measure vaccine effectiveness as negative design. And, um, and, and so it was like, nothing. Uh, <laughs> effectiveness against um, infection, right? So not disease, right? These are young, healthy people with a well sample. And so it's not quite, doesn't mean the vaccine sucks. Um, and so, but that was, it was a drift year. So it was drifted compared to most of the Northern Hemisphere vaccines. So the students were easily vaccinated. I think it was like 40%, um, you know, certainly not like COVID. Um, and so I think there was a lot of community debt. Um, and then and then it was a drift about that. That's all the time we have for questions. So thank you for the talk. Thank you for coming.